In this video, I'm gonna show you what you can do right now to make your videos look more cinematic. Okay, look, the YouTube filmmaking community is built on that word, cinematic. And real, real filmmakers don't like that, but I mean, what's wrong with that? We're all having fun here, we're all learning new things. There's nothing wrong with that. Cinematicness. I mean, I love that word, even though it's probably not a word, but that doesn't matter. Anyway, so today I want to show you what you can do to make your videos look more cinematic. But before we start, you need to understand a few things. First of all, there's no such thing as a universal cinematic look that doesn't exist. It's all super subjective. And when I look at all the questions that I get on this topic, it's clear that you're not all looking for the same thing. Some of you ask me about slow motion, some of you ask me about aperture, and some of you ask me about colors. So what I try to do in this video is bring all those things together that could affect the cinematicness of your videos, of your footage. Some things are underrated, some things are overrated. And then it's up to you to find out what's missing in your videos, you know? And secondly, secondly, to some extent, gear matters. So if you see a movie and you're like, wow, that's the exact look that I want. Well, it's gonna be difficult if you don't have the exact same camera, the exact same lenses and the exact same guy to do the color grading. You have to be realistic, you know? But don't worry, because you can get great footage out of an average budget camera, no problem. I'll also show you some comparisons between a budget camera and then a more expensive camera. But anyway, so enough jibber jabber, here we go. How to get a blurry background. It's usually one of the first things beginners look for, getting a shallow depth of field. But when it comes to making your videos look more cinematic, it's not about how blurry the background is, it's about having control over the blurriness of the background. That's what it's all about. I also think that a blurry background looks beautiful and cinematic, but you don't want it always super blurry. It depends. When the background is important, for example, you don't want to blur it out completely. But then, if you want to really isolate the subject, remove all the distractions, then you should go for a blurry background. And of course, the setting that controls the blurriness is aperture. But it's all about having control, and there's one piece of gear that gives you that control, an ND filter. An ND filter is a filter that you screw on your lens, and it blocks a certain amount of light. Now, why would you need this? Well, when you're shooting video, you set your frame rate, ISO and shutter speed. And ideally, you don't touch those settings while you're shooting, especially shutter speed and frame rate. Unless you want slow motion, of course, but that's a different story. So the only settings you can use to adjust the exposure is ISO or aperture. But ISO, you also don't want to touch if you don't need to. So that leaves just one, aperture. But the problem is that when you change the aperture, you also change the look of your image. The lower the number, the more blurry the background will be, but also the more light that will come in through the lens onto the sensor. And that's the problem. You know what? Let's continue this outside because it's nice and sunny and that's the perfect conditions to show you. So if you want to shoot wide open in very bright conditions like this without overexposing your footage, you're gonna have to use an ND filter because then you can use the ND filter to adjust the exposure and not the aperture. Which means that you have control over the aperture and how blurry the background is. Because right now the aperture is set at f22 to get the correct exposure. But the background is not very blurry, right? So what if I want a blurry background? Well, then I'm gonna have to use an ND filter, which I will do right now. And now the ND filter is on and I'm shooting wide open at f1.8. The ISO, just like before, is on the lowest setting. And you can see now, maybe it's a little bit exaggerated f1.8, but now you can see the difference with and without ND filter. I can get a nice blurry background in these bright conditions. Because I can adjust the exposure with the ND filter. Let me show you. So I can make it brighter and darker just by twisting, turning the ND filter. So recap, a blurry background looks beautiful and cinematic, but you have to have control. It's a creative choice and that's why you need ND filters. The problem with light is, first of all, that there's easy light and difficult light to shoot in, and then also ugly light and beautiful light. 
but of course that's subjective. Now, what I always do, because I don't have a crew to light my scenes outdoors, what I always do is pick the right time of the day to shoot in, to shoot at, to shoot in. English. I probably say so many things wrong, but sometimes they're just one thing that I start focusing on, like right now. Picking the right time of day to shoot in or at. Let me know. Um, anyway, so here in my studio, it doesn't matter because I can control all the lights and I can make it look like whatever I want. If you want to see a breakdown of my lighting setup here in my studio, then check out this video. Okay, um, but outdoors, different story. On a cloudy day, it's not really that important because the clouds will make the light nice and soft even though it will look different in the evening compared to at noon, for example, but you won't have that harsh sunlight. But on a sunny day, I always try to avoid noon. If I don't have to shoot at noon, I won't. I'll always try to shoot in the evening or in the morning. It's easier and it just looks better. Let's go outside again. This is what it looks like at noon on a very bright day. And it doesn't look very nice. I mean, there's all these harsh shadows in my face. I have to squint my eyes. The highlights are too bright. It doesn't look nice. And this is what it looks like in the evening. The sun is almost gone and the light looks a lot softer now. There's less of that harsh UV light. And in general, it already looks more cinematic. And it's easier to shoot now. So it's all advantages. And another technique you can use is backlighting your subject. It's something you see a lot in movies because it creates depth. And that's what it's all about when creating a cinematic looking image. Depth. So my favorite times to shoot at are golden hour, right before sunset, and blue hour, right after sunset. They both look completely different, but both are equally beautiful. And it makes it a lot easier to get great looking cinematic looking footage. This is what most filmmakers look for when they're buying a new camera, a lot of dynamic range. So a camera that has a lot of dynamic range or a sensor, it means that the sensor can capture a wide range of light intensities. Ooh, I hope my wording is correct here because when it gets technical like this, then my English is not, uh, you know, it's not up there. But anyway, I think you understand what I want to say, right? <laughs> But anyway, so yeah, and a lot of dynamic range is usually also associated with a cinematic looking image. It doesn't have to be, but usually it is. But let me just show you again, outside. It's a super bright day, I tried to set up a high contrast scene here and I'm shooting with my Canon M50, which doesn't have a lot of dynamic range. So I know that I'm gonna lose either detail in the highlights right here or the shadows. It depends on what I expose for. Right now I tried to expose my face properly, but you can see here already I think that the highlights, they're losing detail. And now I switch to my Sony a7S III and it has a lot more dynamic range. So that means that it can capture a lot more detail in the highlights and the shadows. I hope you can see it here in the highlights and then the dark tones of my t-shirt and the tree behind me. So there's a smoother transition from highlights to dark tones and it generally looks nicer and more cinematic. Cinematic. And here are some more comparison shots. So what you can do when you have a camera that doesn't have a lot of dynamic range? Well, go back to the previous tip, light. Try to shoot in low contrast conditions, lighting conditions. Try to either have control over the light, like in my studio here, or if you're shooting outdoors, then try to pick the right time of the day, low contrast. Evenings, mornings, cloudy days, People really underestimate the power of light when it comes to the look of your image. This is not something that you can learn in a day, but you can definitely start right now. Composition is super important and a good composition makes your image look more professional and cinematic. And an easy way to start is to just simplify your compositions. Don't try to cram too many things in the frame. Keep it simple. Make sure that the viewer can see right away what the subject is and that there are no distractions. And there are a lot of guidelines that you can use when you start to learn about composition. Look for the rule of thirds and golden ratio, you know, all of those things it can help so composition really affects the look of your videos from chaotic and amateuristic to professional and cinematic 
Also simple things like cutting off a head too much or limbs. And often it's just a matter of taking a step to the left, left, this is left for you, to the right or a little bit back to get that head in the frame or a limb, you know? Similar to depth of field, focal length is also a tool you can use depending on what you want to achieve. The focal length changes the angle of view and also how your subject relates to the background. It really changes the look of your image. And people with a lot of filmmaking or photography experience, they can see if an image was shot with a wide focal length or a long focal length. Also, how blurry the background is changes when you change focal lengths. A longer focal length will give you a more blurry background. And finally, also movement looks different. Here's the same shot with an 85mm and a 35mm. So there's not one cinematic focal length, but it's a tool that you can use depending on what you want the shot to look like, depending on the type of shot. Here on YouTube, a lot of times cinematic is synonymous with slow motion and vice versa, but just forget that. I mean, there's a time and place for slow motion and it does look really cool, but shooting a whole video in slow motion doesn't automatically make it cinematic. Not at all. There's a lot more to it. And what if you want sound? You can't shoot a conversation in slow motion. That doesn't make sense. But yet, maybe you do want to make a conversation look cinematic. So again, it's a tool that you can use to make a shot look more dramatic, for example. And if you use it well, it looks great. But shooting a whole video in slow motion doesn't make it magically cinematic. That's not how it works. There's also not one movie that's shot entirely in slow motion. That would be... Whew. But you should definitely learn how to do it. You know, learn about frame rates and shutter speeds because at some point in your filmmaking journey, you're gonna have to shoot in slow motion. Just not all the time. This is another very controversial topic. Look, here's my point of view, my opinion. There's color correction and color grading. And color correction means that you make your footage look realistic, what your eye sees, or as close as possible to what your eye sees. And color grading, that's not about making your footage look realistic. Quite the opposite, actually. The colors and contrast of most movies is not realistic. It's not how your eye sees the world. But that doesn't mean that it looks weird. It still feels natural, even though it doesn't look natural. Understand what I'm saying here? So a good color grade should feel natural, but it doesn't have to look realistic and natural. I think that's a good way of saying it. And you can use LUTs or do it manually, but no matter what way you do it, a good color grade can make your footage look more cinematic. It's a big part of the creative process and you don't want your cinematic video to look like the news, right? You don't want a horror film to have super realistic colors. And it's not easy to find a balance. It's a mistake a lot of beginners make. I also still make that mistake sometimes. And that's going over the top with your color grade. Let me show you an example real quick to show you what difference it makes. This shot here in my studio, I color graded with a LUT that I made specifically for here, the studio shots. And this is what it looks like. This is color graded. Now, let me change the settings of the camera and I'll set it to the standard color profile. And then I'll show you the difference, what it looks like without color grading. So this is what the colors look like straight out of camera with a picture profile. Oh, I forgot what it was, but one of the picture profiles. So I didn't do any color grading to this shot. But again, it's very subjective because some of you might like this more. Some of you might like a good old teal and orange, but other people hate that. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with it. It's just subjective. But a good color grade does make a difference because you can emphasize the atmosphere of your video, for example. You know, you can go happy and bright or dark and moody. And it makes a difference. It makes a big difference to how your audience perceives your video. Camera movement is super important, but there's not one cinematic way to do it. You can shoot handheld with a stabilizer or with a gimbal. It all depends on what you want to show the viewer. And even a static shot 
also looks nice in some situations. But usually adding some movement to your shots is an easy way to make them look more interesting and cinematic. A scene with a lot of action, for example, looks a lot better when it's chaotic, shot handheld. And then a shot of a nice landscape looks great when there's a slow movement. So adding some movement to your shots makes all the difference, even if it's just a little bit. Another controversial topic, frame rates. Look, I'll just tell you my opinion again. In the movie world, in Hollywood, the standard is 24 frames per second. So if you want the standard, the cinematic standard, then it's 24 frames per second or 25, that would work too. And the higher frame rates you use for slow motion. That's what I do. But look, is that a rule? I mean, not really. It's maybe the standard, but not a rule. There have been movies shot in higher frame rates. I didn't like those, but again, that's subjective, you know? And here on YouTube, for example, because of the technical specifications of computer screens and other screens, some people like to shoot in 30 frames per second because they think it looks more smooth, which actually is true, but it does change the look of your image a little bit. So you'll have to try it out for yourself. 30 frames per second, 24 frames per second, and then see what you like the most. Now, shooting in 60 frames per second with a shutter of 120th of a second, that's something I would never do because I hate the look of that. For slow motion, it's okay, but not for real-time footage because then you get the soap opera look. I don't think it looks very cinematic, but again, feel free to experiment. One important guideline that you should remember is that your frame, no, your shutter speed should always be double the frame rate, especially when you're starting out. Once you learn more about how it works, then you can try to experiment also there. Use higher frame rates or lower frame rates, you know, you can do some things. I feel like my energy is like going lower and lower because it's so hot here in the attic. And um, I don't know if you can see it, but I'm starting to sweat, man. <sighs> but I'm gonna finish this video. Okay, and then finally we have mist filters. And a mist filter is like the cherry on top. You know, ND filters are a necessity. Mist filters, only if you like the look. I like it because I think it really gives your footage a cinematic look. A mist filter lowers the contrast and gives all light sources a nice glow, a dreamy glow. Let me show you. So, this is what it looks like with a mist filter. Right now it's a Tiffin Black Pro mist filter. So this is what the light looks like. And now I'm gonna remove the filter and then you'll see the difference. So this is what it looks like without the mist filter. See this light source, it looks a lot harsher. You don't have that, that glow, that blooming effect. I think wit looks a lot nicer, but hey, who am I? And a lot of other shots also look really cool with a mist filter. Sunset shots, for example, or window shots. The light coming from a window also looks really nice when you use a mist filter because it gets that glowy effect. And mist filters are not cheap, but I've noticed that a lot of times a mist filter is like the missing link for a lot of you. Because the effect is subtle, but once you know what it does, then, then you can see, you can really see the difference between with and without. And you'll be like, ah, that's it. Okay, wow, I think that was it. Was that it? This must be my longest video ever. But anyway, so, I hope it really helps because I get this question a lot. I want to make my footage look more cinematic. What should I do? And you know, all of you are looking for something different. Always remember, there's no such thing as one universal cinematic look that doesn't exist. It's super subjective. And also, it's not just about the look. Don't forget a good story and good music also makes all the difference. And most of the things that I've talked about in this video are tools that can help you to get the look that you want. But don't think that if you check all the boxes that automatically your footage looks cinematic, you know? Anyway, if you have questions, just drop them in the comments and I'll try to answer them. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you 
in the next one.